Hey folks, welcome back. Time for another bit of Star Trek Adventures RPG goodness. This time we're going to take a look at the Klingon Empire core rulebook. So I mentioned this briefly during my video about how to start playing STA as one of the four possible options on how you can start playing the game. It does have some advantages against the regular core rulebook and the starter set and the other things as I mentioned, but really I think you need this book if you're into the Klingons. If you want to have a campaign featuring the Klingons in a significant way, or if you want to play as Klingons, this is the book for you. But I wouldn't recommend it as your first STA core rulebook for the reasons I explained in that other video. But it does have a couple of advantages over the original rulebook. And we'll go through them a little bit as we just flip through. I'm not going to go into the, into the rules detail uh, this time around because you know that from the core rulebook video. But uh, I'll show you how it looks and some of the key differences. So you can tell, first of all, where we are, where our perspective is coming from this time. So we have a Klingon Empire map in the end papers rather than the Starfleet kind of galaxy-wide perspective. You can tell already that the visual design is totally different. The book is also longer by, I would say, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 pages than the original core rule book. That's probably because, you know, they, they took a little bit more space to provide some more examples. They also added some new options for character advancement, which is probably the major contribution made in this book you can see here under character development. So we'll get to that in uh, chapter four. But one thing I would say, definitely, is that before you really dig into this book, I don't normally really pay attention to the foreword, but actually this foreword is really, really good because it explains Klingon culture in an incredibly clear and appropriate way. So I think a lot of people's perceptions of Klingons is they're this kind of bloodthirsty, you know, honor-bound warrior stereotype, but they completely overthrow that and say, you know, that does a complete injustice to the way the Klingons actually behave. You know, that that's an accurate aspect of who they are, but really what defines Klingon culture is that they're passionate, not just about war and about battle and about honor, but about everything, you know, life, culture, artwork, uh, Klingon opera, you know, Klingon acid rock, whatever. They approach all of it with fierceness and passion. And that's what defines the Klingon heart, not just, you know, honor and duty and warfare, but passion, this kind of fierce approach to life in general. So do read that forward. I, I would rarely say that, but it's a really good one. <laughs> Secondly, we have a nice introduction as well, which gives you a nice little sort of reasoning behind, you know, why another core rulebook as well. So basically, they, they took the opportunity to review the existing rule set, clarify certain areas, a few of them particularly around space combat, um, provide more detailed example text, and to revise specific sections of the rules, notably the sections on reputation and character advancement. One thing I should say, though, is that people who have recommended getting this book because of the reputation and character advancement stuff... All of that is also found in the Rules Digest in the Tricorder set, or you can buy it you know, separately as a paperback. So if you want to stay in the Fed perspective and use the reputation system from the Klingon rulebook in a Fed sort of orientation, then just pick up the Rules Digest to get those rules. It, obviously, it's sort of oriented towards a TOS background, but you can adapt it to whatever you want. So that's a much cheaper way to go about it. If you just want to get those rules and have the ni nicest, clearest presentation of the fully updated rules in a nice compact package, the paperback rules digest, either in the tricorder set or separately, will do that for you. But that's, again, another reason why I think you need to be into Klingons to care about this book. <laughs> um, the entire thing is written from a Klingon perspective, not this initial bit, which is all just kind of what's a role-playing game, example of play, the structure of the rules, etc. This is written in a sort of more generic intro to an RPG kind of voice. They also give you a nice list of essential viewing, so key episodes about Klingons and their culture, back from the original series and the animated series all the way up through Voyager, Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, etc. And also, if you have the Discovery campaign book, as I mentioned in a previous video, there's some more Klingon background in there that you can use as well, but bear in mind, they look totally different, and it's kind of weird. But it is there if you want to use that additional lore. The other thing is that this book has a nice intro adventure at the end as well. So all this stuff here, chapter two, you know, this is the kind of history of the galaxy from the Klingon perspective. And you can tell that it's written from the Klingon point of view. I mean, they've got all these kind of log entries, you know, for the Empire. <laughs> and it says stuff like, Starfleet has proven a worthy foe, facing off against the Empire in many conflicts, from Donatu 5 to Caleb 4 to the Azure Nebula. So, you know, it, it, it's this is coming from a Klingon perspective, and they evaluate, you know, their, their triumphs and tragedies across the centuries, and their views of other Empires through that perspective. And I think it's great fun to read for that reason alone. Even if you're a big Star Trek fan, you know, you know all the history, you know all the big stuff from the shows, etc. I still think it's a lot of fun to get that kind of Klingon vibe and see how they view, you know, the Breen, the Maquis, Bejor, all this kind of stuff. Tholians, you know, 
They talk about them in terms of their, their prowess in battle, whether they're seen as weak or strong, and how their evaluations have changed over time. So they talk about, for example, the, the Romulans. They mention that some Klingons have considered the martial Romulans to be more appropriate allies to the Empire than the peace-oriented Federation. And they explain you know, why that, that wasn't the case. And they even have their views on the Borg and the Gorn, the Orions. And they view you know the, the Dominion and the Borg in particular as great threats to the Empire, which, of course, they share that again with the Federation. And there's a memoir entry about what it's like to fight foes with no imagination i.e. The, the Borg, fighting a thousand relentless enemies at once. And they even mention Species 8472 and the Herogen, which were found in the Delta Quadrant, and some of the more unusual foes encountered in the past, like the Organians and the Q Continuum, and the being at the center of the galaxy from Star Trek V. So they really they get deep into the background with this. And then we get a history of the Empire... So, you know, basically, before this time of Kales the Unforgettable, there was no Klingon Empire, there was only Klingons. There was a lot of kind of tyrants ruling local fiefdoms, basically warring with each other and trying to keep onto their territories. But then it came to the time of Kales, and he believed that honor should rule the day, basically, and that it wasn't enough to sort of just please whatever your warlord happens to think, but that one should bring greater, greater glory to yourself and, and think of oneself as a Klingon for, foremost and not just a servant to whoever happened to rule your feudal area. And so, for many years, Kales then ruled all of Kronos, Lucara by his side, and his way of honor then became the centerpiece of Klingon culture. And so they talk a lot about, you know, this kind of religious and, and historical background to the Klingon Empire, which is super interesting. You know, I, I thought I knew something about Kales, but there was definitely things in here that I hadn't heard about before. Additional details, you know, there's little bits like opera excerpts, you know, I mean, it's... Like every book in STA, they fill it with flavor. Then we move on to the 22nd century, which is where you know we started having, let's say we, uh, the Klingon Empire, started having encounters with Earthborn peoples. 23rd century, sort of the rise of the Federation, you know, gaining more and more territory, and then the signing of the Organian Peace Treaty, various clandestine campaigns to win worlds to the, to the side of the Empire under the terms of the hated Peace Treaty. It says, true, the Klingons in question use dishonorable means, but victory is truly the greatest honor in any battle. And besides, the means we were engaged by mere kucha, not true Klingons. So a little bit of, you know, post-talk justification there, but there you go. <laughs> There's a, a log entry about Triple Trouble, Triple State Klingons, if you remember the, that from the episodes, it was always kind of funny. And then we get into the days of the 24th century. So basically with the help of Federation engineers, the atmosphere of Kronos was cleaned up. So then we have some writing from a Ferengi perspective, which is interesting. Yeah, we get to sort of the Klingon Civil War period, and then we get uh, to the modern historical period where basically we have the Dominion War, you know, so we had the Katoma Accords, which linked the Federation and the Klingons as allies, and then the massive conflict of the Dominion military, during which also the Romulans got involved. So at the end, the summary, since the end of the war, Chancellor Martok has consolidated his power base, restored the order of the Batleth, which had grown largely ceremonial over the centuries, to its original purpose of enforcing the words of Kales and the ways of honor among Klingons, and even retrieved the sword of Kales from where it had been lost in the Gamma Quadrant. New ships have been built to keep the Empire strong, and the worlds that fell to the Dominion have been restored to their former glory. In the wake of the Dominion War, the Federation has also been rebuilding. While the Romulan Star Empire has been the subject of a failed coup that has left their Senate murdered, and the usurper who orchestrated the coup dead. Cardassia has suffered tremendous devastation, and it will be decades before they are even a weak power again. The Breen have retreated to their own territory with their tail between their legs. As for the Empire, if the past is any indication... Their road to the future will be paved with battle, with glory, and with honor forevermore. And then we get some great content here about Klingon culture, which is invaluable if you want to play as a Klingon, of course. So the, the concept of honor, blood oaths in the sidebar here, the role of women in Klingon society. So there is a patriarchal nature to Klingon culture, but basically since the earliest days of... of the Empire, women have played pivotal roles in various parts of the Empire's success. They serve in the military and at all levels of government and industry, so women are a big part of happenings within the Empire. We've seen that with the, the notorious Duras sisters in the films and so forth, in various episodes of the TV show as well. We go through general tenets of society, some specific rites and rituals, gender identity and, and sexuality. So Klingons appear to be weathering this evolution of understanding, i.e. kind of gender fluidity, and sexual identity with far more grace than other societies facing similar challenges to established norms. Some credit this rec admittedly recent development to the nature of Klingon culture itself, which from its beginnings largely embraced the notion of gender equality in theory, if not always practice. To many, supporting such fluidity and in gender and sexual identity is simply an expansion of a concept they already accept. 
So I didn't know that about the Klingons either, but apparently they're pretty cool with, you know, queer identities and, and so forth, which is really interesting. Then we've got death rituals, the rite of vengeance, mating rituals, weddings, divorce, the beliefs in Stovakor, the Klingon afterlife, and the Hikvat ceremony, which is the ritualistic ending of one's own life, which is not still widely practiced, but some do still do it. Then we have the basis of their religion, so a lot of that is focused around Kales, various sacred texts and uh, historical objects. So the Sword of Kales, which was mentioned as a great find for the Empire during the Dominion War, is an example of that. Cornerstone of many Klingon belief systems is that those who die with great honor, you know, perishing during battle or carrying out an epic heroic deed, Stovakor is your final reward. The journey of your honored spirit to the afterlife begins with moments of death. When fellow warriors, family members, or close friends stand guard over the body, they initiate a ritualistic death howl, announcing the imminent departure of a warrior from this plane of existence. So, you know, the afterlife is still a big deal to Klingon culture. And they, they go into detail about how Stovakor actually works, which is pretty cool. Then we've got background on the political structure of the Empire, so led over by the Klingon High Council, which is the primary government authority. Then the role of the Chancellor, kind of the face of the Empire, both to the Klingon people and to interstellar powers. The right of succession, overseeing the, the peaceful transfer of power, hopefully. And then there is a little side note here about the leadership priorities of the Klingon High Council under Chancellor Martok 2375. So another, another little neat bit of flavor to give you a sense of place and time in the game. Then they talk about the role of counselors as their roles as consultants to the Chancellor. Uh, the role of Klingon ambassadors and their different diplomatic relationships relations with the various peoples of the galaxy. So, of course, with the UFP, they have a mostly stable relationship with the Federation, and while the two don't always see eye to eye, both still have a grudging respect with each other, and they tend to aid each other during times of crisis. Their alliance during the Dominion War and their shared victory is a shining example of, of how two formidable foes came together to defeat a common enemy and enjoy the rewards of the ensuing peace. So, and now, and now thanks to the Katoma Accords, Federation Klingons actually have officer exchanges. They allow each other to explore beyond each other's territory. So that's opened up new venues for Federation scientists to explore beyond the boundaries of Klingon space. So lots of great things have come from, from that final piece after many years of, of conflict between the UFP and the Klingon Empire. Now, as with the Romulans, there's a tumultuous history there as well. So there was some working together during the mid-23rd century where they exchanged some Klingon weapons information for some cloaking devices. They agreed to establish a diplomatic presence on the third planet of the Nimbus system, located in the region of space intersected by the neutral zone sep separating territory claimed by the three major powers. That peace, peace initiative failed in short order, but there remained a desire from the High Council to share technology and info with the Romulans. Basically, that sort of deteriorated relations between the Klingons and Romulans 2340s and 2350s tended to giving way to open hostilities on infrequent yet devastating occasions, and Romulan attacks on the outpost worlds Narendra III and Katoma remain open wounds in Klingon history. And actually, those particular conflicts were what kind of eased relations between the Federation and the Klingons. As for the Cardassians, they were never friends at the best of times, but spurred on by the Dominion threat, basically, the war against the Klingon Empire with the Cardassians did not go well for the Cardassians, since they were tied together with the Romulans and the Federation. So the Cardassian Union basically crumbled and allowed itself to be annexed by the Dominion. And basically, the Cardassians returned to the squalor they endured after the war, with their home world ravaged by the conflict and their ill-fated decision to join, to join forces with the now vanquished enemy. As expected, there are few Klingons who would offer sympathies for the Cardassians' plight. <laughs> The Dominion, of course, uh, nobody likes them. They're awful. They were treacherous and dishonorable. Their shape-shifting founders basically created huge crimes against the Empire by having a changeling impersonating General Martok to convince Chancellor Gowron to attack Cardassia Prime, at which point the Klingon Empire withdrew from the Katoma Accords and declared war upon the Federation, so that was an absolute disaster. So finally, after restoring good relations, after this discovering it was a changeling the whole time, the, the Dominion will forever remain uh, a thorn in the Empire's side. The Ferengi, there's not a lot of positive things that the Klingons will say about them. They certainly don't accord with Klingon notions of honor and moral principles, and they also declare themselves neutral during the Dominion War, so they're kind of viewed as cowards as well. They do, however, still conduct some business on a civilian level, with Ferengi. The High Council tends to ignore the Ferengi, viewing them as outside the attention base to other more important affairs of interest to the Empire. The Empire has engaged Gorn warships in battle infrequently. The Gorns seem to be satisfied with just kind of staying to themselves as long as nobody crosses their borders, so there's not a lot going on there. Nausikans, nobody's really, none of them has really tried to take on the Klingons from the Nausikan Empire, so they kind of view... The Klingons view them as intriguing for their potential as opponents, but they pretty much ignore the Nazgans otherwise, as long as they avoid Imperial space. The Organians, obviously there was some, shall we say, difficulties that the Klingons had with the Organian Treaty imposed upon the Klingon Federation war fleets. We've already kind of covered that a little bit. 
Tholian assembly. Basically, the Tholian ships in first contact with the Klingons. Basically, the Tholians attempted to assert ownership over a star system recently conquered by Imperial warships. And the skirmish pushed the Tholians away and back behind their established borders where they remained until encountering the Federation in 2268. By the 24th century, the Tholians have become isolationist, although some still feel believe that the Tholians might try to expand at some point. At the outset of the Dominion War, the Tholians signed a non-aggression pact with the Dominion, essentially offering free passage to the enemy forces invading from the Gamma Quadrant, which was not a great move. The Miradorn, which nobody really knows much about, nor cares much about, the Imperial Intelligence has been known to employ Miradorn civilian transports to surreptitiously ferry agents and other assets, while hoping to avoid the, the attention of Federation starships along the neutral zone. So that's interesting. Another thorn in the side, as well as the Federation and other rivals, is the Orion Syndicate. Orions tend to avoid encounters with Klingons. Members of the Klingon Defense Force are forbidden, forbidden from participating in such activities, basically any sort of encounters with Orions. While they've tried to make overtures to establish trade policies and other commercial endeavors, the High Council does not recognize the Orion government as a legitimate entity. So the Breen, of course, are kind of an enigma, since the Empire first encountered them three centuries ago. The Breen er- earned a measure of respect from the Empire when they attacked Earth, which was an incredible act of audacity, which they had to respect. But then the Breen Confederacy joined with the Dominion, which kind of ended that. So now, to this day, most Klingons eye the Breen uh, with unchecked suspicion and disdain. So, then we get into the great houses of the Empire, which we'll kind of merrily skip over. You know, there's a few that you'll have heard about. Of course, the House of Duras, Lursa and Bator, the House of Mog, where we find Worf and his son. The House of Sompak, Budlesh, Moga. There's, a, there's the House of Gorkon, we've heard from before. The current great houses, the House of Martok, of course. And yeah, quite a few great houses still around. And then there's minor houses as well. So they do have a low status compared to the high-born high houses, but that can always change. Minor houses throughout history, and then there's current minor houses that could potentially rise to a greater status. One never knows. Then we get into the history and purpose of the Klingon Defense Force. So this is the formidable Klingon Imperial Fleet, basically. So that's what it used to be called. Now it's called the Defense Force, which is a little bit, a little bit less threatening, I suppose, than the Imperial Fleet as far as naming goes. But uh, the purpose is much the same. It is a purely military organization, so it's not like Starfleet. They don't do exploration and stuff like that. It is by far the Empire's biggest recipient of funding, resources, and personnel. So the Serving in the KDF is a big, big deal, and going out and fighting for the Empire is an important thing to do as a Klingon. So each of the Great Houses has their own military that contributes to the KDF, and there are two main elements. So you have the Deep Space Fleet and the Internal Security Force. So the Deep Space Fleet is comparable in size and capability to the Federation Starfleet with Roman military, and then... The internal security force is a permanently staffed element with its own hierarchy and etc. They maintain observation and tactical outposts. They support colonies and defend them. They enforce the laws, including anti-piracy and customs and search and rescue, all that kind of stuff within the Empire's borders. And then there's a Klingon Oversight Council, so they approve the selection of officer candidates for the KDF. And then there's the Order of the Batleth. They're an elite group within the Klingon Defense Force. So this is a recognition only given to those warriors who have demonstrated remarkable courage and achievement in battle. That's one of the highest awards you can receive, subordinate only to the Order of Kales or being declared a Dahar Master. And there's a little sidebar here about the secretive activities of Imperial Intelligence. So they're comparable to Starfleet Intelligence, to the Romulan, Romulan Tal Shiar, or the Cardassian's Obsidian Order. So they are the kind of clandestine component of the Klingon Defense Force. And it is a, a path you can choose. If you want to be an intelligence agent in the KDF, but it's not for everybody. So the Order of Kales is the highest honor you can receive as a Klingon. Basically, you're recognized for our honorable service to the Empire over a sustained period of time, during which you've shown to, con- to have conducted themselves with unwavering bravery and selfless sacrifice regardless of personal risk. Only the Chancellor of the High Council carries the power to so recognize an individual. Those who earn the distinction receive the Star of Kales, one of the highest decorations the Empire can bestow, and its wearer is to be known for all time and without question as a warrior in the finest tradition of Kales himself. At last report, fewer than ten living warriors hold the Star of Kales, with Chancellor Martok being the only Klingon to earn the honor before ascending to that position. Then we get into Klingon training. So, this is the KDF is purely a military force. It's a bit more hardcore than Starfleet, and focused on being a warrior, basically. So you get trained with bladed weapons, like the classic Batleth, the Mechleth, the Diktog Dagger. You get trained with energy weapons, mainly disruptors and so forth. They, of course, have an officer training pro- program. And there's a nice uh, comparison table here 
just to give you the equivalent KDF rank as compared to Starfleet, as compared to the Romulans, as compared to the Cardassians. So it's kind of helpful. And of course, soldiers can continue training to seek career advancement. And while you're undergoing basic instruction, the officer candidates select a military specialty for which they receive additional training before getting their first duty assignment. So typically, he'll be chosen either for the Internal Security Force or the Deep Space Fleet. So that's quite interesting in a way. You could imagine two very different kind of Klingon campaigns right from the outset, right? Uh, the backdrop being the internal functioning of the the internal security force and the difficulties within the empire itself, holding on to Klingon colonies at the edge of their territory or fighting off the last vestiges of Dominion or Breen outposts or whatever. Or you could be in the deep space fleet and dealing with big stakes deals with Romulans or fighting off Gorn or whatever. So that's pretty cool. And there's some details about Klingon duties aboard a ship, how landing parties work, including boarding parties, and then some key worlds and locations. So there's Kronos... So it's the beating heart of the Klingon Empire. It's had a tumultuous history. <laughs> so I like this. Planetary classification. We have refused a request to integrate with your Federation planetary classification system. Now that we are allies, it is irrelevant how many species use its system. We have no desire to use it or to learn the human alphabet. This is our planetary ad classification. We advise you refer to it as needed, as we shall do the same with yours. Level 1, Charg, class, conquerable. Level 2, Yan class, exploitable or of use. Level 3, Tok class, habitable. So conquerable, habitable, exploitable. Those are the only things they care about. <laughs> you know, they're an imperialist society. What are you going to do? We have some little bit of Klingon poetry over here as well. And they actually use that classification throughout the book. You can see, again, this book is, is really thoroughly to be viewed from the Klingon perspective. Rua Pente, so it's a legendary kind of prison world. We've got Organia, Agilon Prime... Tribble Prime, <laughs> by order of Imperial Mandate 7, no vessel under any condition, emergency or otherwise, is to visit Iota Geminorum 4. Violation of this mandate is punishable by death. So this is how much Klingons hate Tribbles and vice versa. And by the way, you can see that the book also has two, not one, but two silk bookmarks, which is lovely. Then there's some notable locations in the galaxy as well. Klingon Federation Neutral Zone, Stovakor, which is like a spiritual place, but they still consider it a place. Martok's Klingon Academy Commencement Speech. It's kind of cool to read. And then we get into the rules. We know all this stuff, but you can see I really love the layout in this volume. The fonts look great. Everything is super readable. I love that, you know, the tables are in this orange that really pops. The sidebars are in red, which really pops. You know, the, the kind of flavor is all in green. You know, there's just this consistency to everything. And the white background does indeed make things more readable than one might expect, given the previous black backgrounded books for the feds. Then we get into the advanced rules. So we have challenges, extended tasks, time challenges, all that sort of stuff. Extended tasks and momentum. And then now we get into character generation. Of course, it's going to be a bit different here because we are talking about main characters who are coming from the Klingon point of view. So we go through the, the details of traits, values, and attributes. Klingon characters can be of any ethnicity, sex, gender, sexuality, and so forth. Such variations will only have impact on, upon play to the extent that the players and game masters wish it. It's also a nice sidebar here about the play style. So basically, as usual, you know, sit down with your GM and your fellow players, decide what kind of Klingon game you want. Do you want to be in the Imperial Fleet or the Defense Force? Do you want, you know, a squad of specialized shock troops? You want to be in the in intelligence things, you know, you, you can do whatever you want to do, really. You could even do a adding alien characters to additional Starfleet crew, and likewise adding alien characters to a Klingon crew. So you don't even have to all be Klingons serving on the Klingon vessel due to officer exchanges with the Federation. And then we have the main stats, the disciplines, and again, nicely showing how they would combine with the different attributes to produce approaches to certain problems, the meaning of your discipline rating, and I love that they give a Klingon translation of each as well, if you really want to go nuts with this stuff. And then your focuses, along with some examples, your talents, and then we have a life path, life path thing. Basically, while there are a number of species who are subject to the Klingon Empire, player characters made using this book are always Klingons. So there's a variation among Klingons. Again, so, you know, you can't use this if you want to play a Federation game. You just can't. You really need to be wanting a, to do a Klingon game <laughs> to buy this book. But yeah, so we go through the standard life path as we would do for Klingons. They show you some examples of, you know, talents and, and attributes during all areas of play, and then during the Enterprise original series era, era, things are a little bit different because of the whole augment virus thing, which was sort of a retcon to explain why the Klingons look like this now instead of like humans with mustaches, goatees. So you, you develop their environment, upbringing, 
whether they were on a spaceship or a frontier colony or another species world, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So then we determine the cast. So are you going to be warrior, merchant, scientific, agricultural, and artistic or academic? And then what kind of training? So you can roll that up on the table or you can choose it if you prefer. You don't have to roll it up on the table. So you can end up training as a command officer, a technical officer, an enlisted warrior, or a laborer. I would think... You know, having a mixed party with laborers could be a little bit challenging, but what do I know? Then your career. So you can be a young warrior, experienced warrior, or veteran warrior. And then various career events that can happen, which will give you, you know, again, flesh out more of your life path history and will give you some benefits. So ship was destroyed, a friend died, another culture gave you sort an honor of some kind, took command in a bad situation, you encountered something truly crazy, an alien... You recovered from a serious injury, you know, there was a nasty transporter accident, all this kind of stuff has mechanical repercussions, but also gives you things to, additional things to say about your character. Um, and then you can put together your finishing touches, values, attributes, and everything like that. Sort out their derived characteristics like stress, damage bonus, name, department, rank, and role, and their equipment. Basically, they'll get a communicator, a uniform, and additional equipment as appropriate. Then you can talk about their appearance, their relationships, you know, their talk about the different kind of ranks you can have aboard a ship. So you'll get a communicator, you get access to a tricorder, of course you'll have a uniform on a Klingon ship. You may have some common tools, like an engineering toolkit for an engineer, a med kit for a surgeon. Characters will get a sidearm, so all warriors and officers carry a diptog dagger while aboard a ship and are issued with a disruptor pistol for boarding actions and landing parties. Either equipment is either obtained as required by the mission or forms a character's personal effects. So you will have at least a close combat and a, a long-range weapon, regardless, basically. Then we get into some talents. So you have standard talents, which are available to anybody. Klingon species-specific talents. So basically physiological redundancies, killer instinct. You have Rustai, which is, you know, you have a ritual sibling, basically, from your house. You can have two battle or warrior spirit. There's additional commands for command, con, medicine, engineering, science and security departments and then there's some tips for creation during play creating supporting characters and now we get to the character development stuff so character development can be through events called milestones and also through the changeable nature of a character's reputation so a um, milestone will be a meaningful event connected to a character's values and the dictates present during missions so they can vary in significance and basically complete a mission you know and you've honored some of your values then, you know, if you, if you challenge the value, you may rewrite it into a different form, and that indicates a change in your views. And if you use values positively, you can make an adjustment to your character. So you can adjust your attributes by one, uh, reducing one by one, increasing another by one. But you can't increase an attribute above 11 or reduce anything below 7. You can adjust your disciplines, again, reducing one by one and adding one to another. You can swap one of your focuses with another one. You can swap one of your talents with another one. Or you can help a supporting character to train. So you can adjust one of their attributes to disciplines, swap one of their focuses, or do any of the other things described above, but for the support character. It's kind of interesting. So milestone options, some personal growth. You get some ship and uh, crew improvements. So you could also adjust the ship systems, adjust the ship department, swap one of the ship's talents. You can improve your own attributes or disciplines, gain a focus or a talent. You can get personal growth by going along a character arc. You can get personal growth, proving your attributes, disciplines, uh, getting a value or a talent, much the same as milestones. For ship and crew, you can choose one ship system, increase it by one, choose one department, increase it by one to a maximum of five, select one talent for the ship, or swap one of the ship's talents for another. So basically, this system of milestones is designed so that a main character's advancement is driven by players, rather than something which happens passively in the background. So basically, given that you start every session with one determination, you always have a chance to kind of put your values into play. And when you do that, that can lead to, you know, a, a milestone event, potentially. So it puts some player agency in your hands about when you want to trigger this sort of stuff. Now, Reputation was really, people liked a lot about this book and was then ported over rapidly to the Federation side of things via the Rules Digest. Basically, a main character. So if you're, a, you know, a typical Klingon character, you know, played by a, a, a person, you know, a sport, sporting character, you have a reputation score of three. And basically, you can have up to five. If you're at three, it's kind of standard. You're unremarkable. If you have a reputation of four, you're, you've got a few glorious deeds to your name. 
If you're five, you're a paragon of Klingon virtue. So it's a it's a pretty tight system. If you go below three, you know, at two, people are skeptical of you. At one, future is doubtful. And at zero, you're not even worthy of being called a Klingon. So you got to be careful with this stuff. <laughs> so reputation changes during the game, basically. So when you get to the end of an adventure, the game master should consider the outcome of the adventure, the decisions that you took, and decide what factors might influence each character's reputation. So basically, they give you a list of questions to answer for yourself. So if you answer yes to these positive influences, like was your mission victorious? Did you positively use one or more of the adventure's dictates? Did you obey your orders? Did you condemn the dishonorable act of others? Did you kill enemy warriors? Did you declare yourself so that the enemies knew who they faced? If you were injured or slain, did you do so in battle facing your enemy head on? If you answer yes to any of those, for a Cleon, that's a good thing. Uh, negative influences, did you fail the mission? Were you disobedient? Uh, did you insult yourself, your crew, or your shipmates, or your house? Did you cheat or break a promise? Did you do dishonorable acts, take prisoners, or allow yourself to be captured, blah, blah, blah. All this kind of stuff that Cleons don't like. Those are negative outcomes. And then you have a reputation roll that you make. So your target number for the roll is going to be 7 plus whatever your reputation is. So the default would be 3. You set difficulty according to the number of negative influences you have. So if you do a lot of dishonorable things, you can end up with a really high difficulty for this roll. Then you roll a number of d20s equal to the number of positive influences you have. So that kind of, you know, is the balance there. You get more d20s for positive things, and you get more higher target number for having negative influences. And there's no maximum number of d20s. So you could answer yes to all of these and have like 7 d20s, 8 d20s, whatever. Then you check for successes. So any d20 uh, which rolls less than or equal to your reputation rating will generate two successes. So it's like you have a focus in that. Any 20 rolled is a complication, which may generate shame if you fail the reputation roll. If you've already got shame, then chance of a complication is higher. The number of successes you've scored is equal to... Oh, and by the way, yeah, as, as, as you would imagine, each d20 less than or equal to the target number, one success, and then um, anything less than your reputation will generate two successes. So if the number of successes you scored is equal to or higher than difficulty, you've acted with sufficient honor. Each success scored above the difficulty becomes a point of glory, which you may spend on various benefits. If you're dishonorable, then you suffer one shame for each success you scored less than a number needed, plus one extra shame for each die that rolled a 20. So then you have to spend any glory you've gained or any shame you've suffered. So it's a really cool system. So using glory, you can use that in a bunch of different ways, right? You can gain favor with NPCs. You can increase your reputation by one, which can be huge, because the next time you roll it, you have a higher chance of success. And you can get, you know, awards and more stuff. You can spend one glory to commend another character in the group if they acted particularly honorably or did something to help you or the or their, your house, the ship. You can purchase awards, which are limited but are potentially really powerful. They have really positive effects. You can create an additional trait for the character or remove a negative trait. If the character is a commanding officer, then they may add a trait to the ship instead, but that costs three glory. You can go from labor or warrior to be given a battlefield commission and become an officer by spending three glory. You can also petition to be promoted to a higher rank by spending three glory. Or you can spend glory to elevate the standing of your house. So that's particular to the Klingons. Uh, but you can obviously see that by the changing the names of some of the stuff, it's very adaptable to the Federation. That's exactly what they do in the Rules Digest, which is really done well. And then they give some awards you can pay for. Dahar Master, so this allows you to become an elite warrior. It costs ten glory but you can pay for it over time. You must have a reputation of five and the veteran talent to take that award. And then once per adventure, you may choose one of your focuses for the remainder of the scene on any task which uses that focus. You will score two successes for any die that rolls equal to twice your discipline score. So that can give you a lot of successes, a lot of momentum. Order of the Batleth costs four, but you must have succeeded at a particularly bold, risky, daring, or heroic action during combat. And then the benefit is once per adventure, after rolling for a task, you may gain two bonus momentum on a successful task or ignore a single complication suffered. So that can be extremely helpful in critical situations. And then finally, you have the Order of Kaelas. Well, not finally, there's another one. Um, but that costs five. You must be an officer in a command or a leadership position who has led a crew in succession of difficult missions, face personal danger on at least two of those. Once per adventure, if you have this award, you can use a direct task, task or otherwise assist a subordinate. You may cheat your d20 as if it had rolled a one. So you get an automatic double success right away. Finally, then, the Order of Kristak, which is a volcano on Kronos, where Kaelas is said to have created the first Betleth. It costs two. You must have faced an extremely dangerous situation and triumphed in spite of it. And so when you have it, once permission, whenever you would suffer stress, have the amount of stress inflicted by an attack or hazard. But then you can use your shame as well. So you, you might gain ill favor. Basically, an allied NPC you encountered during the adventure regards you as a worthless patak. <laughs> uh, you can reduce your reputation. You can take a demotion. You can stain the reputation of others aboard your ship, which uses two shame. That's a pretty nasty thing to do. You can remove a, an award that you received to remove the shame. You can take a dishonorable status like dishonor, cowardice, disgrace, or remove a positive trait that gets rid of three shame, or you can reduce the standing of your house, 
or you could be stripped of your duties and, de and detained, basically. So it's a really cool thing. If you act really badly and you fail your reputation role, you've got to spend that shame somehow, and that has real consequences for your character and for their, for their missions. So it's a great set of rules. It's really dynamic and fun, and it's no surprise that people immediately wanted that for the feds. Now, what else we got for the Klingons? We got the whole creating a house thing. You determine your house status. You can be old and fallen, old and resurgent, long and prestigious, new and eager, iconoclast, new and rising, or roll again, if you roll randomly. Um, and each of those has different sort of in-game effects. You can also have a different house legacy. You know, you might be leaders, warriors, engineers, physicians, or something else. And your houses can also grant you, you'll have leaders and commanding bloodline can give you a house talent. And then there are sort of things like ancestral blades, trained from birth, and you get different talents depending on what your house legacy is about. You know, if you're an engineer or, or stuff like that. Then you work out your house temperament. So you could be enthusiastic, hot-tempered, thoughtful, calm, stoic, audacious, traditional, unyielding, and these all have, again, in-game benefits, basically. A starting Klingon house starts with all three attributes at six and divides a further six points among them allocated however you wish. Your house attributes are influence, might, and wealth. So it's pretty cool. I mean, you, you, you can play a political game aspect in the Klingon version that you really can't do so easily in the Federation version. So then they talk you through how to use the house in play, how to deal with respect and rivalry, how to advance your house so you can forge alliances, you can use your reputation, you can spend glory to increase your house's reputation, you can engage in conquest, you can incite division or reduce standing or dissolve your house to get rid of lots of shame. So again, really bad things can happen if you commit dishonorable acts in this game. Um, in, in terms of weapon and tech, not a lot of surprises in here. So again, as with the main game, you know, some weapons and stuff will need an opportunity cost, meaning you need to spend some momentum to get the item, and others have an escalation cost, which gives the GM threat, because it's basically upping the level of potential danger. So there's different kinds of ways you can develop or innovate on equipment. You can build prototypes of stuff. They talk you through details of te Klingon technology and its evolution across different eras of Star Trek. And then advanced technology and less advanced technology. So it's a sort of general guide. And then we have, very important for Klingons, combat gear. So we have the typical stress effects, right, that you would expect for weaponry. It could be an area effect, intense, or the cost to avoid an injury caused by an intense weapon increases by one for each effect rolled. Um, you could have the knockdown effect, you have the piercing effect, which ignores resistance, or the vicious X, which inflicts X additional stress for each effect you roll. You could also have qualities, like accurate, Needs charging, cumbersome, deadly, debilitating, which means it's harder to heal injuries from that weapon. Deadly means it's much harder to make a non-lethal attack with that weapon. It could be hidden, harder to detect, could be inaccurate, so you get no benefit from the aim action. Or non-lethal, which is the reverse of deadly. If you try to make a deadly attack, it's harder. Melee weapons, of course, we have the very famous examples of those in the Klingon world. Now, typically, they use disruptor weapons. So there are disruptor pistols and disruptor rifles. And there are some phaser systems as well. Here they give you an example of warrior's weapons. So we have the famous Batleth, the battle blade. We have a disruptor rifle, which is a two-handed affair, and uh, various disruptor pistols, the Duktog dagger, Kutluk dagger, and Mavak dagger. And then a list here of various different weapons, also including Andorian plasma rifles and things like Jem'Hadar plasma pistols, because you might want to play in the Dominion War period. And they go through the details of phases as well, because you will encounter other societies that use them, including the Federation, and you may work together at some points. Klingons also tend to make use of light or heavy body armor. You can also use environment suits or personal force fields. In terms of tools and portable gear, so there's a lot of similarity with the Federation, really. You know, you have a lot of medical devices, cortical stimulators, hypospray, you know, tricorders, anti-grav sleds to move stuff around, communicators, emergency transponders for emergency transport, pads, which you see, you know, like a tablet, basically, a holographic imagery, um, pattern enhancers to help beam out of difficult places, and some cybernetics as well, artificial organs, artificial sensory organs, and prostheses. Um, then we have the rules for combat, which again, we'll just flip through because we know about all this stuff. Minor actions, you know, zones, all that good stuff. Again, they've got this lovely flowchart here to make it much clearer how combat works and samples of the different tasks that you can do during a turn as well. Everything is just really, really nicely laid out in this book. How to deal with stress and injury, avoiding injuries, consequences of injuries, 
dealing with healing, conditions, etc. Weapons and their effects, qualities, combat momentum spends you can take, getting a disarm for two momentum, you know, buying D20s, adding stress or avoiding injury. Some of them are repeatable and immediate, some of them not. Improvised attacks, which is always uh, handy in a bar fight, I suppose. And they have a nice big example of melee combat, um, which is great for the, for the Klingons. Then we get some Klingon Imperial Fleet details. So again, this is all good stuff here. We've got the different main roles on the ship. The captain, first officer, second and third officers, helm officer, weapons officer, science officer, engineering officer, and the ship's cook. He's doing something super gross. I don't know what that is, but I don't want to eat it. <laughs> And the ship surgeon, the medical officer, you know, equivalent. Oh, and then there's a detail on the ship's menu on a Klingon ship. So we all know gach, which is fresh, freshly served serpent worms. They can be live, freshly killed, or stewed, but it's a considered a great Klingon delicacy. Rocked as well as a dish of live worms. Okay, then we have some details of how to use the starship profiles, starship weapons, resistances, shields, the different tasks you can do aboard a starship depending on your station, a, a warp factor chart, so translating warp factor into kilometers per hour, number of times light speed, and the distance it would take to the nearest star and across a sector in the galaxy. So handy if you want to um, add some realism, I suppose, and it gives you some basic tasks you would do in the different you know, sensor department, Tactical comms, engineering, using a cloaking device, shuttle bays and cargo bays, operating small craft, transporters, and the medical ward, and launching and landing shuttles. The procedure for that. And then we get into Starfleet, uh, Starship Combat. So again, we use a system of zones for this, similar to characters. And then they tell you about how to use Starship tasks to make different attack actions. You can rally the crew with war cries. You, you know, if you're at the helm, you can do evasive actions or attack patterns or even ram another ship. You can use sensors to scan for weaknesses. You can plot a new course, chart hazards. You know, you can do with from security, you can create internal containment fields. At tactical, you have a lot of control over weapons and shields, obviously, including the, and the tractor beam. With comms, you can try to intercept or jam signals, get a damage report, or open a, a hail if you need to communicate with your opponent. And then there's some details on boarding actions, which is, of course, an area of strength for the Klingons. And again, you know, great summaries of how to make an attack, starship hit location table, and then the ship damage thresholds by scale. So, you know, how many breaches it takes to blow up a system, depending on the scale of the ship cover for starships, which is hard to come by, but it could be things like asteroids or hiding behind a planet or whatever. Ways to simplify NPC starship damage, additional breach effect, how to repair starship damage, and starship combat momentum spends, of course. And then they've got the rules for starship creation as well, which is cool. So we have the various key classes and space frames for the Klingon Empire. We have the D7 class battle cruiser, very famous, very deadly. You know, typically they've got scripters and phasers and photon torpedoes and cloaking devices after 2272. We've got multi-role escorts and we have heavy fighters, D12 class bird of prey, Civilian transports, the Cavort class bird of prey, which we've seen on many an episode of Star Trek. Of course, they have a cloaking device as well. The Partok transport and the Vorcha attack cruiser, which is a big ass flagship and not to be scoffed at by any means. And it does have a the command ship and cloaking device designations. And you can see one in action right here. So pretty vicious, very impressive warship. Then we get into mission profiles. So a ship's mission profile could be as with Starfleet, a number of different things. Crisis response and interception, multi-role battlecruiser, intelligence and reconnaissance, scientific and survey, strategic and diplomatic, warship or house guard. So a lot more kind of warrior type roles as you might expect. Um, and you can get refits as well. And they give you the de details of typical weapons. And then the various possible talents that you can have for your starship. And traits, such as being a prototype, it's a bird of prey, long-serving or renowned, and then naming the vessel. So always make sure to give it something that sounds cool. Look at your Klingon dictionary out. Then we've got Klingon star bases, which is, you know, functions in a very similar way. A little bit on Klingon colonies. Here's some examples of, well, there's an anomalous world. Got class M, which is Earth-like. You know, the different classes according to the feds. Environmental damage types, which you can encounter on uh, nasty planets. Dealing with alien encounters as a Klingon. Dangers you can encounter in interstellar space, like pulsars, black holes, gravity waves, etc. And gravitational distortions, all this kind of stuff. Mokbara and the art of warp core maintenance. <laughs> so how to take care of your ship and make sure the warp core doesn't explode. And then we've got details on alien vessels, which in this case includes... Some key Federation vessels, the Connie class, 
Constitution Refit class, the Defiant class, the Excelsior, and the Galaxy class, and the Intrepid, and the Miranda. So some classics there, of course. For the Romulans, we got the Bird of Prey, and the Dideradex class Warbird, which is extremely scary for a number of different reasons. We've got the Cardassians with their Galor class cruiser, the Dominion Jem'Hadar attack ship, and the Jem'Hadar warship, which is really nasty because it has anti-cloak sensors as well. And they have advanced transporters and also Polaron-based weapons, which can get through shields. Then we got the Borg, even scarier because everything is huge. It's just huge. They've got advanced transporters. They've got regenerative systems. And they got threat protocols. Basically, they, they carefully analyze the combat situation and respond appropriately. And Borg cubes are absolutely colossal. So basically, no dis system on a Borg cube can be destroyed without first locating a vulnerability. But normally are presented by creating an advantage, though this advantage should be especially costly, difficult, or dangerous to create. Not easy, by any means. Finally, we have the Decora class Marauder, a typical craft of the Ferengi, who are actually reasonably powerful ships. Then we have a lovely game mastering se section, which is, yeah, basically, I mean, there's some general tips about, you know, failing forward, helping people out with character creation, managing the rules during play, dealing with complications and threat, you know, dealing with threat spends, combat and extended tasks, setting up challenges for your players, you know, making sure that everybody in the different roles gets a chance to contribute, using and creating supporting characters and NPCs, random behavior or cultural traits for, for adversaries and NPCs. Then NPCs has opposition. So NPCs can spend momentum in a way, but it's a threat spend basically from the GM side. I'm going to give you some hot tips for quick promotions and adjustments and also for dealing with NPC starship damage. Useful talents to give to special NPCs that you know, are really supposed to be badass. Then experience and promotion, so dealing with uh, milestones, reputation, which we talked about before, and with glory and shame. And then creating missions, so how to plan a session. You know, think about scenes, encounters, and how they, they take you through a kind of the standard structure of an adventure. Making sure to maintain good pacing, particularly during space combat, which is not necessarily easy. But it can help to set up a zone map that gives people a sense of place during a space battle. And these are two really nice examples, actually. Setting up some obstacles or some kind of stellar phenomena to make it more interesting is also cool. And you can use threat spends as well to, to bring more reinforcements just when they think they're, just when they thought they were out, you pull them back in. Then there's some details on creating campaigns. So stringing together missions and creating planets, using these random tables if you want, or choosing attributes that you find interesting. And then we have details about what kind of stories are worthy of a Klingon. So for example, to expand the empire, conquer what you desire. I particularly like the Klingon Romulan border or Klingon Federation neutral zone. There's always interesting stuff going on over there. Officer exchange program with the Federation is also interesting. And the Shackleton Expanse campaign guide can be used for the Klingons as well as the feds, which is very nice. And what plot components should be contained for Klingons? Well, you need to have matters of honor. You know, you could have obligations to your house. Some elements of conspiracy or spiritual elements, political rivalry, and then subplot components could be, you know, ostensibly it's a space exploration mission or a medical crisis or a planetary survey. But through that, the principles of an honor of the crew are tested. You know, that would be the ultimate kind of Klingon mission. So there are some additional plot components that, that work well for Klingons, like escorting other vessels, patrolling a border, basically challenging someone to ritual combat to try and get promoted or whatever, making a tactical assault, taking an oath of vengeance, you know, to, to preserve the honor of your house or yourself, espionage, do you have cloaking devices? That helps a lot. And then there's a bunch of mission briefs. So the Great Gorn Gaff, you know, they have lots of cool names, Scale Force... Again, I'm not going to go you through, get you through all that. NPCs, we've got some different Klingon variants, from minor to notable to major. So Kang, Mara, Kor, Commander Krug, Commander Claw, Vixis, General Chang, General Kord, Valkris, Ambassador Kamarag, Chancellor Gorkon, of course he's notable, Chancellor Azetbur, Colonel Worf, Lieutenant Clog, Lieutenant Komal, and Gowron, of course. Love that face. Look at that. <laughs> and the Dura sisters, of course. Lursa and Bator. And Toral, son of Duras. Well, there's the Dura sisters. Lovely. Nice to see them in an illustration. They're so famous in the uh, canon. We've been up to a lot of no good over the years. Well, there are a ton of major NPCs. I love the deep dive into Klingon history we've got here. And then Worf as a major NPC. Look at him standing there looking all hard ass. Worf is great. The clone of Kaelas as well. Groka, 
And then we got some allies from the feds. So generic sort of officer types and Rear Admiral Thiran and Captain Tomek. Then we've got some Romulan adversaries. So the general characteristics of Romulans, Centurions, Talshiar agents. We've also got Cardassian soldiers, Cardassian glins and gulls. We've got menial Ferengis, Ferengi salesmen and uh, Diamond Scale. That's a commander of a Ferengi starship, basically. And of course, the Dominion, we got the Jem'Hadar, bred solely for combat. A Jem'Hadar first, who leads the Jem'Hadar squadron, and the Vorta overseers. For the Borg, we've got tactical drones, technical drones, and medical drones. And then for various beasts, we've got the Denevan neural parasite, the Glomers, genetically engineered bulbous predators with four spindly legs and two eye stalks created by the Klingon geneticist Kedge. Made for hunting, basically. Talarian hook spider, gross. The Targ, which is a favored companion of Klingons, like dogs for humans. Tribbles, which hate Klingons and vice versa. The Mugato, which we've seen in, of course, Lower Decks and other things. The Selat, a large bear-like creature from Vulcan. And the Berengarian dragon, which is 200 meters long and breathes fire. So yeah, there are dragons in Star Trek. And finally, we have the intro adventure, which, yeah, we won't obviously spoil that for you. But I will show you the KDF personnel file. This is the Klingon character sheet, which looks absolutely fantastic. I love the way this looks. Your life path, your house information, and then your worship registry form with its various departments and systems. Yeah, so, I mean, I can't say enough good things about this book if you love Klingons, which I do. It's absolutely fantastic. And as well, I would recommend getting the GM kit because, thank God, the GM kit for the Klingons is a normal-ass, portrait-oriented GM screen, which is beautiful, instead of that weird square thing. It's got all the same kind of stuff on it. Example difficulties, uses for determination, NPC qualities, threat spends, complication ranges, challenge dice, personal momentum spends, starship weapons, starship damage, NPC starship crew scores, personal weapon summaries, personal weapon qualities, making attack procedure, injuries and stress effects, melee combat options, including grappling and shoving, disengaging and striking, normal combat tasks, and minor actions as well. So everything you need as GM to run your scene smoothly. And then fantastic action-packed artwork on the other side. We've got all the different types of Klingon starships uh, with a beautiful planet surface in the background. They're blowing the hell out of something. I can't even tell what that is. Is that, I don't know, is that a Gaylor class? Cardassian something? I don't know. But whatever it is, it's really dead. And these Klingons are not messing around. So I love it. It's a brilliant, brilliant GM screen. And as with the, the normal GM screen, it also comes with a map. This one, of course, however, is the map of the Klingon Empire, as you can see here. Same one we get at the, the end papers of the Klingon Core rulebook. But then on the flip side, uh, we have a more conventional map, which sort of gives us a position here. So now we see how the Klingon Empire is oriented with the UFP on one side and over here. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. Then we've got the Romulan Empire over here and the Shackleton Expanse, which is the focus of another book that we'll look at another time. So that's handy. And then as with the other set, you get these wonderful cards made from beautiful thick paper or cardboard of some kind, which summarize the things you need in different positions on the ship. So there's commanding officer reference along with the rule summary on the back. Communications and internal systems reference. There's a conflict reference and momentum spend, so that can be passed around the table during a combat. Um, you've got a helm and navigation reference for that guy, for that officer. You've got security oversight and tactical reference, sensors and internal systems reference. So again, you know, beautifully redone with the Klingon style and uh, always with the rule summary on the back. So they're really great for new players to help them get used to the system, which is going to be very different from D&D. And on top of that, unlike the other GM kit, it comes with an adventure. So this is designed to help you know, new GMs get into the vibe. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but there you have it. So that is the Klingon Cold Rulebook and the contents of the GM kit, which is quite expensive for what it is, to be honest. It's like 40 pounds, which is crazy, but I got it on sale for much less, like 24, and for that, I, I didn't mind at all. Cold Rulebook is beautiful, and if you love Klingons, just buy it. If you're a Star Trek fan, just buy it. It's great fun to read. But if, you, if you're just starting the game out, don't start with this. Get yourself the Rules Digest or the Core Rulebook or both and start there. Learn from the Federation side um, before you start digging into the Klingons because the Klingons, as great as they are, I think it's better to start with the more generalized form of the game first and see how you like it. And then if you like the system and you enjoy it, pick up a, a copy of this and the Klingon 
appropriate GM screen, which looks and feels great, and then go nuts. So I hope that was helpful for you guys. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of STA as a system. I think the books are all really, really well done, and the Thing on core rulebooks, perhaps my one of my favorites. I mean, the, it's just done with such love for an empire. I think they presented it extremely well. They made it such an intriguing way of, of playing the game from a totally different perspective with new elements included, like house politics and so forth. New awards you can win, the new reputation system, which is now uh, adopted across the entire game system because it was so well thought out. So yeah, if you're at all interested, I, I hope this really helped you out and helped point you in the right direction. Let me know in the comments if you have this core rulebook or the GM kit or if you have any other thoughts on role playing as Klingons in the STA universe. In the meantime, stay well, take care of yourselves, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video and in the comment section below. Alright guys, take care and bye bye.